by uh, one of the fathers and uh, acknowledging them of their role in the family. And in fact, we have to acknowledge our Heavenly Father uh, that have given us everything, everything in, in, in that we need. Amen. And again, as Pastor Away says, that we're in a series. Now we're in the third part of the series, uh, which is uh, titled Redeemed by His Blood. I have no slides, so bear with me. If you have any Bibles with you or electronic Bibles, let us open our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. Amen. I will be reading it from the King James Version. It says, In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His good grace, wherein He hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just bless you, God, for this wonderful day, O Lord, for all the blessings that you have given us, O God. And even, O Lord, for being at us for this place, O Lord. Father, we pray for your Holy Spirit, O God, to be with us this day. Father, talk to us through your word. Cleanse our hearts, make our hearts right, O God, with you, Lord. And Father, may you be glorified in our midst today as we share, as we listen to your word, O Lord. Change our lives. And all glory, now not be unto you alone, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. So uh, as the series goes, uh, it meant it is on Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 to 14. Now the first was chosen to be holy, which Pastor Balaam shared, which was verse 3 and 4. And then the second was predestined to be his sons. So now we can call him our Abba Father, our Heavenly Father. That was verse 4 and 6. And now uh, the spiritual blessings in Christ that we're going to uh, share today is about the redemption by his blood. Now, it says redemption through his blood. What do you think about redemption? What is redemption? Or what does it mean? From the Greek word it says it came from a Greek word apolotrosis, meaning a releasing effected by payment of ransom. So it means like if somebody kidnaps something, someone, and he wants to be released, and then the kidnapper wants a ransom for payment for him to be released. So actually, that action is called redemption. When they say you have, you have redeemed the captive from his captor by paying a price in exchange for his liberty. Amen? Uh, redemption also means with deliverance and liberation procured by a payment of a ransom. So, so when we think of redemption, there is always a payment involved. Uh, we can think of it as well as when you go to a pawn shop. Right? If you need money, you have some jewelry, you go to the pawn shop, pawn your jewelry, and they give you money. So when you want to get back that, that uh, jewelry, you have to go and redeem your jewelry. And in order to redeem that jewelry, you have to pay back the loan that you have taken from the jewelry shop. Amen? In other words, the English word redemption means repurchase or buy back. And in the Old Testament, referred to the ransom of slaves. In the New Testament, the redemption word group is used to refer both to deliverance from sin and freedom from captivity. So it also refers to atonement no? as a medical, uh, metaphorical sense in which the death of Jesus pays the price for our ransom, releasing Christians from bondage of sin and death. Now, it is part of us, the, the spiritual blessings that Paul uh, wrote uh, to the Ephesians. Now, why is it? Why is it considered a great spiritual blessing? Now, first of all, what is our greatest need? What do you think is your greatest need? What do you think are you asking for in a daily basis? If you are sick, you may think that your greatest need is to be healed of this illness. If you are unemployed, 
your greatest need is to get a good job to provide for your needs. If you're single, you may think, my greatest need is for a baby. If you're in a difficult marriage, you may think, my greatest need is for harmony in my marriage. If you have a child who has become ensnared by drug abuse or substance abuse, you may think that the greatest need is for your child to be free from this addiction. But while all these are important needs, no? all these are important, none of them are your greatest need. The greatest need that we have or we, we need for, for, of every person, whether we recognize it or not, is to have God forgive our sins before he, before he dies, before we die and face God's eternal punishment. Amen. Health, good health, all the riches that we can, and a happy family are wonderful blessings. But if we die without God in our lives, these blessings will be useless. Your greatest blessing is to know that God has forgiven our sins, or your sins, and that we are reconciled to the Holy Judge of the universe. Now, there is a story, uh, something about a guy from England, uh, from Ireland, who met a little Irish boy who caught a sparrow. You know what is a sparrow, a small bird? No. The poor little bird was trembling in his hand, so the boy caught, his, caught it in his hand and seemed very anxious to escape. The gentleman begged the boy to let it go. So the man said to the boy, Can you just let it go? Anyway, it's no use to you. No? Uh, as the bird could not do any good for him. But the boy insisted that he would not, for he had chased it for three hours before he could catch it. He tried to reason out with the boy. The man tried to reason to the boy, but he failed. Finally, the man think that maybe I will pay for a price for that, that, that bird. So, he offered to buy the bird. Now, the boy agreed with the price, and it was paid. Then the gentleman took the poor little thing, the, the sparrow. Uh, the boy gave it to, to the man. Yeah? And held it out in his hands. Now, the boy had been holding it very, very fast for the boy was stronger than the bird. Meaning to say, uh, it was very tight. He was holding it very tightly. Just as Satan is stronger than us. And there it sat for a time. When it was in the man's hands, and the man was trying to release it, it was still in his hands for a while. Well, for a time. Scarcely able to recognize the fact that it had got liberty. But in a little while, it flew away, chirping, as it said to the gentleman, Thank you, thank you, you have redeemed me. And that is what redemption is, buying back and setting free. So Christ came back to break the fingers of sins, to open the prison doors and set the sinner free. This is the good news, the gospel of Christ. Ye are redeemed with we are not redeemed by corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Now why do we need redemption? Why cannot we just redeem ourselves or make ourselves right with God by our own efforts? Actually, the scriptures also answers that. In Romans 3, that it is written that none is righteous, not of one. In the beginning, God and man was in great communion, and there was fellowship with God and man. And then God wanted man to obey him, to love him, to willfully just obey and love him, and just, he gave him one commandment. He gave him the Garden of Eden to take care of the Garden. Amen. And then he said, you can eat everything in the Garden, and just Except for this tree, of the fruit, now the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Just one, one instruction that he said to the man that to touch. And what does God require from there? He just needs obedience and trust. That in spite of the good thing of that uh, tree, he has everything. Amen. 
man. So what happened is Satan, so subtle, came in and tempted the woman. Now because it was good to the eyes and to make one wise, so uh, Eve was tempted to eat that fruit. And then when Adam came, he also told Adam, Adam just eat the fruit. So they disobeyed the command of God. And because of that, they were separated from God. And they realized that they were naked. Amen. And then what was God's first action when they committed sin? What was His first action? God knows that they committed sin, but what was His first action? He was going down, looking for them. Adam and Eve, where are you? In spite of them sinning, He was looking for them. And Adam and Eve, because because of the sin, they were ashamed and they hid before God. And then God saw them. Amen. And because of that sin, because they disobeyed God, that's why it went through from generation to generation and no one is righteous, no not one. Amen. And only God is righteous. And in Romans 3, 23, it says, For all have sinned, none of us can say that we are righteous, and clean before God and come short of the glory of God. And in Romans 5:12 it says, Wherefore, as by one man sin into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Now, why do we need redemption? Because the price of sin is death. And do you know the great love of God for us? That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know that His plan, that He predestined us to be all saved, if we just accept Him. Amen? So we planned it from the beginning uh, to save us. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. But why cannot we save ourselves again? In Isaiah 64 says, it says, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags, and we do all fade away as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. What is the required sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins as required by the law? And then, and then since God loves us so much, He said to, during the Old Testament, He said, Instead of you dying, offer me an animal to die in your place so that I can atone your sin. So every year, every year, they go to the temple and they bring an animal with them to kill him in the altar, in the temple, as a representation of themselves dying. Okay? So that they will be cleansed from their sins. And in fact, before they kill the animal, they will lay hands on the animal. That signifies the transferring of the sins to that animal, and the animal will be killed. But what was the requirement for that animal? Is it just any animal? He said, in, in Exodus 12, 5, that you should bring a lamb, the lamb for that animal shall be without blemish. Pure. A male of the first year, he shall take him out from the sheep or from the goats. Now, our God is a righteous God and a God of His Word. God will never go against His Word, even to Himself. What He has spoken, He will do it. The only way for us to be saved and delivered from the penalty of sin is to redeem us. Now, how? How can we redeem? For, for what? By what? And that goes to the scriptures only through the blood of Jesus Christ. We need an offering and Jesus took it upon himself to take our sins and die in the cross for our sin. He took our penalty with him on the cross and died on the cross. And then not only that, he died 
But after three days, he overcame death. And he rose from the dead. Amen? Jesus shed his blood to redeem us from our sins. And why does the New Testament insist on the necessity of Jesus shed blood? In Romans 6, 53, makes it clear as we have said, the wages of sin is dead. If God declared that the wages of sin is dead, but then eliminated the penalty, he would compromise his perfect justice. Okay. He would be like a judge who told the murderer, you are forgiven, try not to do it again without any penalty. Okay, Amen. You, know, uh, you know an incident in the U.S. that there was a, a guy who raped an unconscious girl in the dumpster and then he raped that girl unconsciously and then what did the judge, what was the penalty of the judge? Judge? Just community service and how many weeks in prison and that guy destroyed the life of a woman and the plea of the parent was he just did it in a few minutes and he will destroy his man's life for 20 years but how about the, the victim? <laughs> Amen? So the people are outraged of the judgment. But for you, is it a, a rightful judgment? You, the case was raped, but the penalty was not being followed. Amen? So, justice demands the appropriate payment of the crimes committed. And that is what we expect, isn't it? If somebody commits a crime, we expect that he should pay the price. Amen? Hebrews 9, 22 states plainly, Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness, or there is no remission of sins. And this takes us back to Leviticus 17, 11, where God explains, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood, by reason of the life, that makes a moment. So Paul here uses the word blood to point us back to the Old Testament sacrificial system, all of which Jesus fulfilled when he offered himself to the cross. Actually, the Old Testament is a picture of the New Testament. It is a shadow. So all of the things being done there is a shadow of what has happened in the New Testament. Amen. And also, particularly the offering for the sin offerings is a picture of Christ offering himself for the forgiveness of our sins. Those animal sacrifices pointed ahead of Jesus, the Lamb of God, who by his death redeemed all whom the Father gave him. He paid for our sins. He ransomed us from the penalty of death. Meaning to say if we, we were supposed to die, but he said, no, don't judge him. I will take his place. But the penalty was still there. The penalty was not taken. The death penalty was still there. But who took the death penalty? It was Jesus who took it, not us. Amen? Now, does God can be just and the justifier of one who has faith in Jesus? So the issue is, either you trust in what Jesus did on the cross as the full payment of your sins, or when you stand before God at the judgment, you must pay for your sins through eternal separation from God and the lake of fire. So there will be no second chance. The scripture says it is appointed that the man wants to die and after the judgment. And so and that's the only what 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 my friend says, that is the only perfect statistics. One hundred percent all of us will die. No matter how well you take care of your body, no matter how much money you have, one day will come that we will die. And that is one reality that we have to face. Maybe some can go ahead, but some may be late, but we are all going there. The problem is, when we face the judgment seat, do we have Christ in our hearts? Do we accept, do we accept His redeeming grace that we be redeemed from our sins? Or do we have to face God by ourselves and face the judgment by ourselves? Amen. Now, that is why making sure that we have redemption through the blood of Jesus is our greatest need. Paul goes on to elaborate on what such redemption means. 
Now, the question is again, why only Jesus' blood is acceptable by God? Because Jesus is the only one that has not seen. In 1 Peter 2.21 it says, For even thereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. Who did no sin, that was the guy who found his mouth. And in Hebrews 9, 12 to, 9 to 14, it says here, Neither by the blood of goats and cows, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats, and the ashes of an hyper, sprinkled and clean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself, without spot to God, purge our conscience from dead worlds to serve the living God. And in 1 Peter 1, 18, it says, For as much as we know that we were not redeemed with corruptible things, okay, as silver and gold, for we were vain conversation, conversation received by tradition of your fathers, but the precious blood of Christ, as of Allah, without blemish and without spot. Amen. Now, every, every religion has given a way to do, to do things to, be, to think that will save them. Amen? Uh, you, sometimes they think that by doing sacrifices, they can cleanse themselves with their sins. And you know, even in our country, uh, most of us, during Holy Week, Holy Week, People hurt themselves thinking that it will forgive their sins. They do sacrifices every year, but after the sac doing the sacrifices, they go back to their old ways. But no changes in their lives. That cannot save them, or that cannot save us. No matter how large a sacrifice we make to make ourselves clean, we can never do it. That's why the Word of God says, Obedience is better than sacrifice. Why? Because when you disobey, it cannot be recovered by any sacrifices. Amen? Amen? Third item that needs to be mentioned here is redemption to Christ's blood means that all our trespasses are forgiven. Okay, this is one, one struggle that every Christian will have. Sometimes we keep on struggling with this. But remember that Christ's blood means that as we receive His saving grace and as we receive His precious blood to cleanse our sins, all our transgressions are forgiven. And also remember this, as Christ has forgiven us, sometimes we cannot forgive ourselves. So we should learn to forgive ourselves as well. Redemption encompasses more than forgiveness. But Paul mentions forgiveness because it is the first and foundational thing to know and experience when you are redeemed. No? It's the first experience of forgiveness. Now what is forgiveness? Forgiveness means losing or letting someone go from what binds them. Trespasses is synonymous so with sin, but the no one indicates individual acts of sin. Not sin in general. All wants us to know that our specific shameful, embarrassing sins that look up in our memories to condemn us are all forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ. Always put that in our spirits, in your spirits, that your past sins have been forgiven. Amen. And if we sin now, God is faithful to forgive us our sins if we confess our sins. Amen. Amen? Don't say that, okay, we will just go there later. The enemy will challenge us for that part. It is crucial for our Christian life that we understand and experience on a daily basis this liberating truth that God forgives all of our sins through the blood of Jesus Christ. In 2 Peter verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 5 to 8, it says here, that Peter is a number of virtues that are to add to our faith so that we will be useful and fruitful in the work of Christ. 
So what it is, let us read 2 Peter 1 to 5, it says, And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you, and among them, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind. This is what he said in verse 9. But he that lacketh these things is blind and, and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was forged from his own sins. Amen. The devil knows this, which is why he is the accuser of the brethren. He's called the accuser of the brethren. Because why? He keeps on accusing us. Even if we have already been forgiven by God through Jesus Christ, He keeps on back, coming back and telling us that no, you are not forgiven. You have still sinned. Amen? It is how it works. We are a believer in Christ. And then we have just have sinned. We committed sin. We do disobey a clear command in God's word. Maybe it was anger, hatred, jealousy, envy, lust, or foul language, or stealing, or whatever. And then the Holy Spirit could fix our hearts. Okay, hey, you have committed sin. Go reconcile to God. Okay, could fix our conscience to our knowledge of the word that what we did was sin. So what do we do? We repent and confess our sin to God and appropriate His cleansing. So far, so good. But it doesn't stop there. Why? Always remember that we have an enemy. Uh, some, sometimes when we were doing a Bible uh, prayer meeting, Brother Barry said, I just forget about the devil of all these things. They were so focused on the problem that they forgot that there was a devil trying to attack them. Amen? We have to remember that we are in a spiritual war. We are a war. We are in a war. And in war there is violence. And the enemy is not, is not resting. He's doing everything. When I say the enemy, it's the devil. He's doing everything he can every day in our lives to destroy us. And if we slack around, that's why God says, put on the whole armor of God. And he even speaks of the word as the sword of the spirit. Amen. Amen. So we should be in a battle. So the enemy will come and whisper to us, a fine Christian you are. Do you really think your sins are forgiven? Huh? You're not even saying because you're still sinning. Amen. You're guilty and you know it. Forget all this nonsense of being saved by grace. Now, how do we answer him? It would seem that he is right. You claim to be a Christian and yet you deliberately, knowingly, sin against God. And did you know that also Paul was struggling with this? When he said, what I want to do, I do not do. And the thing that I want to do, I cannot do. Amen? So all Christians are struggling with this. But there is grace and mercy of God because He said, if we sin, we just come to Him and ask forgiveness and He's able to forgive us our sins. Amen? There is only one way to answer the devil when He accuses us. We can say to Him, you're right. I did sin, but my salvation does not rest on my sinless performance, but by rather on the blood of Jesus Christ that paid the price of my sin. I'm trusting in His shed blood, and if His blood is adding in to acquaint me, I am doomed. So the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Amen. So we will use, if we hear these accusations of the enemy in our minds and hearts, we should counter it with the word of God. And you know, Satan will always challenge the word of God. And that is his one first strategy ever since in the beginning. 
When he was tempted, Eve, he said, Did not God say? Yeah, because you will be challenged by so. He's challenging the word. Even now, he's still challenging the word. Amen? And then we might think, Oh, so it's okay to continue to sin because God is faithful to forgive, uh, forgive us our sins. So it is fine. But what God said, what God did before say, God forbid. Amen? Uh, God forbid. To tell, uh, this is fine for every day my own sins, but my sins are too terrible and too repeated for God to forgive. Surely I must do something to make up for or pay for the awful things I've done. Not so, said Paul. In Zechariah 3 verse 1 to 3 says, And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to kiss him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a branch plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments, he stood before the angel. In verse 4 and 5, And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garment from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with chains of raiment. And I said, Let them set a fine white metry upon his head. So they set a fine metry upon his head, and clothed him with garments, and the angel of the Lord stood, stood by. Amen. Now going to the fourth, now we go to the fourth point, which is Forgiveness of sin is still a matter of grace. Amen? Rich grace. We are redeemed through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. So this means that there is no sin to great before God. And sometimes we concentrate on big sins. But do you know that said, no liars can enter into the kingdom of God? Amen? Small sins. Amen? A sin is a sin. What the God says, that if we sin in, against one commandment, we have sinned on all of them. Amen? So, do not think that you, have, you are a good person because you have not committed large sins. Again, okay? these are conditions of men that we have taken in that only big sins are not okay. Lying is okay, stealing by things, small things is okay, stealing more bread from our company is okay, but that's still stealing. Telling a lie is okay, because it's a white lie. Oh well, now the devil is coloring the light. <laughs> is there a color for the lie? A lie is a lie. <laughs> better than better than speak than I'm telling a lie. Amen. Now, this shows that there are no sins too great for God to forgive to the blood of Christ. This has always been God's appeal to, re to repentant sinners. In Isaiah 5, 55, 6 or 7, the prophet calls in verse 6, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found, call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon him. He will abundantly pardon. Amen. That is how, how great the love of God is. That in fact, He gave His only begotten Son to die for us. Even if we say we have a best friend, but who among us will die for that friend? Amen. Sometimes we just speak, but when He is in trouble, we say, Oh, bahala <laughs> kana Amen. Now, the measure of God's forgiveness is not according to how much the how much we sacrifice ourselves or mourn for our sins. Although we should mourn uh, when we realize we have sin and and go against God, rather the measure of God's forgiveness is according to the riches of His grace. Love is us. Now, what is grace again? Grace is unmerited favor. Something that you do not deserve, but you receive it. Amen. Paul does not say, out of his riches of grace, but says, according 
to the riches of his grace. Now, we can, we can picture it as, it's like, as like this. If you are a millionaire, a very rich man, and you ask for, and someone asks you for a contribution, and uh, for a worthy cause, and you gave him, and, and that millionaire gave, gave you $100, he has given out of his riches. But if he hands you a blank check, for you to put how much you want to fill in, okay? He has given according to his riches. Amen? The word lavish may be illustrated by ocean waves. Do you know the ocean waves? It's, it keeps on flowing one after another. It doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. They just keep coming and coming and coming. They never stop. God's forgiveness is like that. For those who are redeemed to the blood of Christ, if you have trusted Christ as your sin bearer, Paul wants us to experience the extravagant, lavish, and the serve favor of God in forgiving all our sins. So it's continuous. That forgiveness is, we have been forgiven, but again, that forgiveness is continuous. Because why? We still sin as we go on to perfection. Amen? Because when we are perfect, well, we are not here anymore. Amen? <laughs> you may be thinking that this is going too far. If we preach like this, people will go out and sin. But, yeah, but, uh, but uh, in Romans 6, 1, 2, it says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? That grace may not abound. Paul said, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer than him? If we say that we are already dead to sin, if someone, something is dead, then it has no life. So if we say that we are dead to sin, sin should not be alive in us. Amen? But still sin continues in one way or another. When you know that the beloved Redeemer shed his own blood to secure our forgiveness, it binds our hearts in love to him. It makes you hate your sin and strive against it all the more. Although we are not perfect, but we do not intend to sin. Our intention is not to sin. But it's because of our nature that sometimes instantly, or an instinct, that we immediately lie or pick up something that is not ours. But actually we don't have a continued intention to, to, to do that. But just in an instinct, because of our nature, sinful nature, but sometimes it's still there. That's why Jesus is telling us to Put, continually put on the new man and to continue renew, renew, renewing our minds with the word of God. As I have shared in the Bible or the life group, we, every day we are bombarded with information in the world. What did the Bible say? What comes into the heart that will come out of the mouth. Amen. The entry point is the eyes, the ears, and our senses. And every day, we are filled with information. And you know the world is being controlled by, the, by Satan. What we see in the movies, in the television, even in the advertisement, all the things that is happening around us in the news and everything, they are failing our minds, failing our minds. And now we have this electronic Facebook, Internet, the more information that we receive. And what are all those information? If you try to filter, filter them out, most of them are not of God. And you are feeding yourself with it every day. So your mind, your heart, will be filled with these things. So in an immediate response to a specific situation, what will come out? Something, everything that you feel in. So that's why God says, always in your mind with the word of God. So that's why even even in the Old Testament, God says, Meditate upon my word day and night. But how much of us are doing that? That's why there's so many Christians living in defeat. Because why? We do not have the word. We do not have the sword to counter the enemy. And when problems come to us, what do we think? We think about the circumstances, but we do not think about the the things that God has done for us, that we are already victorious in the midst of that circumstance. Amen? And we should expect trials and tribulations to come our way because it's 
In this world you will have tribulations, you will have trials. That is what the Word of God says. And that is what we will experience. But be of good cheer. He said, I have overcome the world. Amen. But sometimes we forget it. I myself am guilty of that. That sometimes in, in so, so much desperation, you cannot sleep at night. You're so much depressed and oppressed, and the enemy keeps on attacking you. And sometimes your, your mind is already so, so turmoiled that you cannot sleep. You don't know what to think. Many times I told my wife during the night, I said, I cannot sleep in bed, so I have to go to the sofa. I just have to think it out. And then just lately, uh, while she was reading the scriptures, you remember Saul, uh, Saul and David, that God allowed an evil spirit to torment Saul. And then you know what can relieve Saul? The soul of David. He, he calls David to bring him praises to God, and he will be at peace. He said, oh, that's true. So if you are in a place of problem, Sing praises to God. Amen. Play songs of praise and worship to God so that it will ease your mind. Amen. Amen. So fill your word. Actually, we are victorious in Christ. The why, why is the enemy victorious in our lives? Because we do not fight him. We just submit ourselves to him. We just do not try. We, we, we just even not, do not try to counter him. We accept everything that he is telling us. Not knowing the promises of God in our lives. Amen. 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 Now, now in conclusion, we should believe, or do you believe this, that in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace? If we say yes, I'm a Christian, I believe this. But do you experience it personally? I myself have struggled sometimes, I admit, actually all of us, that from time to time we sin, and even from time to time, the enemy will put to remembrance in our minds our previous sin. And that's why I always, I always confess, I am redeemed. I am been cleansed by the blood. You know, I'm not promoting Jewel Austin, but he, is, he has a book called The Power of the I Am. So, yeah, I am redeemed. I have been uh, cleansed by the blood of Christ. So confess it in your lives. When the enemy says, Oh, you have still sins, you are not forgiven. Think, I, have, I, have, I have been forgiven. I have been cleansed by the blood of God. God has saved me. I have been victorious in my circumstances. Amen. Now, and do you extend God's love, His grace, and forgiveness to others? And also, not only to us. But do we extend this grace to others? Do we learn, do, have we learned from Christ the forgiveness of God that we also extend this forgiveness to others? Do you know what the Lord's Prayer said at the last portion? Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Amen? And even, there's even a, a parable there that before you go to the altar, if you think that you have offended someone, before you proceed to the altar, go and reconcile to that brother or sister and then bring your offering to the altar. Because that offering will not be accepted because your heart is not right with God. Amen? And mostly our, our relationship problem is just unforgiveness. But we should learn, we should learn from Christ and from God that He has forgiven us. Amen. And we should extend that forgiveness to others. Here is one scenario that is so common in the church. One night in a church service, God opened the heart of a young woman to respond to His call and believe in Christ as her Lord and Savior. She had a very rough past, you know, involved in alcohol, drugs, prostitution. So he has done so much uh, uh, bad things in the past. But the change in her was evident as she experienced God's forgiveness. So we accepted Christ in her life 
And over time, she became a faithful member of the church and served by teaching her children. It was not long until she caught the eye and heart of the pastor's son. Okay? And the relationship grew and they began making wedding plans. But then the problem began. Many in the church who knew the woman did not think that the woman with a past such as hers was suitable for the pastor's son. The church began to gossip and argue about this matter, so they decided to have a meeting. Emotions heated up, tensions increased, and the meeting was getting out of hand. The young woman became very upset about all of the things being brought up about her past. As she began to cry, the pastor's son stood up and spoke. And he said, My fiancé, my fiancé's past is not what is on trial here. What you are questioning is the ability of the blood of Jesus to wash away sin. Today you have put the blood of Christ Jesus on trial. So does it wash away sin or not? And that opened their eyes and the whole church began to weep as they realized that they had been slandering the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, sometimes we prejudge people. We prejudge them of their past. They become Christians. Yes, we accept them that they have received Christ in their lives. We are so happy. But again, from time to time, we think about their past. Ah, si Juan, is he so? What did he put them in? This is not da, 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 da. But again, he has a bit forgiven. Amen. Sometimes we have this, we have this song that one can wash away my sins. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You, you, you have that song? What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Either that's true or not. Amen. If the blood of Jesus does not wash away all of our sins completely, then we're all in a lot of trouble. <laughs> but again, because we all have a lot of sins to deal with, if it only atones for minor sins, what good is that? In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of the grace which He lavished on us. And thank God that is true. Cling to Him, live it each day and every day in our lives. God is not a liar. God is not like unto man. He never lies. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Heavenly Father, we bless you, Lord God, for your word. And we thank you, Lord God, for your redeeming grace, O Lord. For redeeming us from our sins, O God, by your precious blood, O God. Oh, how precious is your love for us, O Lord. That even, Lord God, when we were yet sinners, you died for us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for, for forgiving our sins, O Lord. And Father, fill our hearts, O Lord God, with that forgiveness, O Lord. That, Lord, we will extend this forgiveness of others, O God. To people who have hurt us, to people who have offended us, O Lord. Father, we forgive them as well, O Lord, as thou have forgiven us, O Lord. Thank you, dear Lord God, for your word. And thank you for pleasing our hearts and minds, O God, with your word. Lord, for glory and honor be unto thee alone. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Amen.